As we've already uh, read uh, from uh, Luke's account, let's uh, read from Matthew 25, although uh, it is uh, uh, in Luke's account that we shall be particularly looking at uh, this uh, as we go through the uh, message this morning. So it's Matthew 21. Did I say Matthew 25? I think it's Matthew 21. Yes. Matthew 21 and verse 1. When they approached Jerusalem and come to Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied there and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord has need of them, and immediately he will send them. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, gentle and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did just as Jesus had instructed them, and brought the donkey and the colt, and they laid their coats on them, and he sat on the coats. Most of the crowd spread their coats in the road, and others were cutting branches from the trees and spreading them in the road. The crowds going ahead of him and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. When he had entered Jerusalem, all the city was stirred saying, Who is this? And the crowds were saying, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. And then you might just like to turn back to Luke uh, 19 because that's uh, where we'll take up uh, something of these things, although we'll be comparing uh, the various uh, versions that are recorded there in the Scripture. Uh, But uh, And uh, from verse 28 onwards we'll be looking at. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that once again we can look at these accounts in the Scripture. We thank you that this is... Uh, such a, an encouraging day in many ways as we see Jesus entering in triumph and yet we know Lord it soon turned to, to disaster from a human point of view and yet Lord we see in this a prefiguration of that triumphant entry when the kingdom of this world will become the kingdom of our God and his Christ so Lord we give you thanks uh, as uh, seeing as it were a glimpse that so many around the world today have accepted Jesus as Saviour and Lord, and proclaim him to be their King. Amen. Entitled the message, The Stones Cry Out, or The Splendour of the King, and uh, no doubt you'll see something of that as we go through. Of course, we're focusing very much uh, upon the fact that uh, Jesus is proclaimed as King here. And uh, therefore, under the title of Majesty, we'll just focus on that for a moment. Uh, Here in Luke, in verse uh, 38 of Luke 19, it says, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Actually, Matthew, as we read, uh, does have Hosanna in the highest, which is something that is added to it, but it's got, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And that's really an exact quote from uh, Psalm 118 and verse 26. A psalm that is very much a a festal psalm, one that is celebrated at the feast. And it's quite interesting, therefore, that right at the middle of it is this this focus on one who is to come. And then it's uh, followed up with the words, Hoshianah, in the Hebrew, from which we get Hosanna. Of course, the Hebrew has gone into Greek and then into English, so it's somewhat different by the time it arrives at us. Uh, but it simply means, save us, we plead. Save us, we plead. And of course, that was part of that cry that went up as Jesus came into the capital city that day. Mark uh, also has, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, but goes on to add, blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David, of Zena in the highest. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. And then uh, John uh, adds, 
And not only blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. As I say, originally the, in the Hebrew was uh, Baruch Haba B'Shem Adonai, uh, which uh, means uh, Baruch is blessed, but uh, comes from the, the word, uh, the verb Barak, to bend the knee. And what it's basically saying is that uh, we, as it were, bend the knee to you. We bow before you. We honor you. So Jesus was very much being honored that day. Haba is the uh, coming one. And uh, Bashem, uh, the name, uh, in the name, and Adonai, of course, is the, uh, the word for Lord, but they used it in place of Yahweh because they wanted to treat the name of God with respect. That Haba is quite interesting because it says, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And actually, the Messiah was often known as the coming one. You may remember John the Baptist sent his disciples to Jesus when John was in prison and perhaps uh, away from it all he began to wonder whether he was right or not and he sent his disciples uh, to, to Jesus to say, are you the coming one or do we look for another? In other words, are you the Messiah, the one that was promised, the one who is due to come, the one of whom it is said, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And that uh, verse from Psalm 118 was very much uh, one that uh, focused on the Messiah who was to come. So as the crowds are crying out this day, they are acknowledging Jesus to be Messiah. But it's interesting that all these other things get added to it. It's almost as if it were that, um, you know, when crowds uh, gather together, you hear in the football matches sometimes, the, the chance just move a bit and uh, uh, they uh, no doubt as Jesus was traveling along all these things were being said basically around Psalm 118 but they were recognizing that he was the Messiah they knew that he was descended from David and Messiah was going to be descended from David therefore in one sense he could rightly be king and you can imagine just how inflammatory that was in Jerusalem in those days with the Romans under occupation. And also shouting out, uh, Hoshiana, save us. And no doubt many were seeing that perhaps this one who was coming amongst them, the Messiah, would deliver them from Rome. There was no doubt that was part of the thinking of some, because they hadn't fully understood all that uh, was uh, behind the, the coming of the Messiah. It's for that reason that uh, the Pharisees said, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. Shut them up. We're in trouble if they carry on in this way. It will be seen that we're raising a resurrect, uh, resurrection, insurrection uh, against Rome. And therefore the, the whole atmosphere would have been highly charged. And the Pharisees were very concerned that this might lead to real trouble with Rome. In fact, you may remember that uh, in the end, when Jesus came before Pontius Pilate, uh, the one way in which the Pharisees got uh, Pilate to actually crucify with Jesus was to say, this man has set himself up to be king, and if he's king, then uh, you're no friend of Caesar. You're not serving the Caesar you should have been, uh, that you've been appointed as governor. And, uh, of course, Pilate meekly gave way in the end, although reluctantly. And it's quite amazing, really, that he actually had that inscription written up. Uh, the King of the Jews. Written in Latin, Greek, and, uh, uh, and in Hebrew. So that everyone who went by, that was the proclamation. And of course the Pharisees were very upset by that. Uh, right, he said that he's King of the Jews. Pilate said, what I have written, I have written. Because I think as he uh, interviewed Jesus, or as he... Uh, questioned him he began to understand there was something about this man that wasn't he wasn't wanting to take over from Rome he wasn't wanting to set himself up as an earthly king because Jesus had made it very clear, clear that if his kingdom was of this world then his followers would fight for him but his kingdom was not of this world Jesus made it very clear it was the kingdom of God in heaven as it were God ruling on earth through his people so you can just imagine, I, I think, you know, we, we fail to understand what it was like in Jerusalem 
on what we call Palm Sunday. And all that was surrounding it. It was, uh, I mean, there were enough people who wanted to rebel against Rome as it was. Even one of his uh, disciples, Simon the Zealot, was a nationalist. I um, wouldn't say he was a terrorist, but there was something of that uh, motivation in his heart. And there undoubtedly would have been others in Jerusalem as Jesus entered. Of course, we do need to remember that they entered on, the, on a donkey. And he came humbly, as it uh, is recorded in Matthew's Gospel, quoting, of course, from, uh, from Zechariah, when Zechariah was prophesying the coming of Jesus. He was not coming, uh, as it were, as a, 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 an earthly king. He was not coming on a war horse. He came on a donkey, because his kingdom was not of this world. In fact, Matthew, all the way through his gospel, keeps on talking about the kingdom of heaven rather than the kingdom of God. Because Matthew wanted to make it very clear to the Jews, and both terms are interchangeable, but he wanted to make it very clear to the Jews that Jesus had not come to establish a kingdom in the normal sense, in a military sense. Jesus has come to bring, as it were, God down to man. The rule of God into our lives. But here it is, uh, the Pharisee saying, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. And uh, perhaps something of their thinking is uh, there in John's Gospel, in John chapter 11 and verse 50. And uh, this is uh, the words of uh, uh, Caiaphas, the high priest. And uh, he uh, says, um, actually this is immediately after Lazarus' resurrection. Jesus had brought him to life. In fact, that's one of the reasons why there were such crowds in Jerusalem. Because this miracle had been known, and some had actually come up from where Lazarus was in in, in Bethany and come with uh, Jesus into Jerusalem. So there were those coming up from Bethany, and there were those in Jerusalem coming down to meet him. And there were vast crowds. But because this miracle had been... uh, uh, been made uh, noised abroad well let me read from verse 47 therefore the chief priests and the Pharisees convened a council and were saying what are we doing for this man is performing many signs if we let him go on like this all men will believe in him and the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation but one of them Caiaphas who was high priest that year said to them you know nothing at all nor do you take it into account that it is expedient for, uh, for you that one man died for the people and that the whole nation not perish. Uh, no, he did not say this on his own initiative, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus was going to die for the nation. And not for the nation only, but in order that he might also gather, to one, uh, gather into one the children of God who are scattered abroad. So from that day on they planned to kill him. So I think you can begin to see Jesus is becoming so popular and there's such a popular movement rising up and particularly here on the, on the day when he's entering in triumph there is great fear that this is going to lead to trouble. And so Caiaphas says it's expedient for the nation that this man dies. We've got to silence him somehow otherwise we're in serious trouble with Rome. And John sees it very much as a word of prophecy. That Jesus is indeed dying for the nation. Indeed, not just for the nation of Israel, but for all the nations. And we know exactly that's what Jesus came to do. To pay the penalty for our sin as he died upon that cross for each one of us. So it was expedient for for you and for me that Jesus should die. But again, I think you can see something of the background of what is going on on this particular day as Jesus enters into Jerusalem. So the, the Pharisees say, for goodness sake, shut up your disciples, we're in trouble if you don't. And Jesus says, if, uh, if they were silent, even the stones would cry out. I myself just reflecting on that, it seems a, a strange thing in one sense, but what he's saying is, if uh, these uh, people aren't uh, greeting me and welcoming and not honouring me, well, the stones would have to do so. There has to be some, uh, as it were, proclamation that I am who I claim to be. 
Maybe again, it just helps to see something that is in the Old Testament. And uh, these words from Habakkuk uh, chapter 2 and verses 9 to 11. Woe to, whom, to, to him who gets evil gain for his house. And then it goes on, you have devised a shameful thing for your house by cutting up many peoples. So you are sinning against yourself. Surely the stone will cry out from the wall and the rafter will answer it from the framework. What it's saying in effect is <laughs> the stones see what's going on here. And the stones will accuse you of the evil that you're doing, of the way in which you're exploiting people, of uh, devising uh, gain, evil gain. Of course, it's not that the stones will literally do so, but almost that the, the stones will bring the accusation because they know what's been going on. And Joshua, and I suppose this is the idea that runs through much of the Old Testament as well, uh, a stone was set up uh, uh, as Joshua said to them, choose you this day who you serve. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And they said, we will serve the Lord. So Joshua set up the stone and he said, you know, if you, you break your word, this stone will bear witness against you. The very fact that that stone was there as a marker, as a monument, showed what they had said. And although it wouldn't speak, it would basically condemn them in later years when they turned away from the Lord. And I guess that's something of what Jesus is saying. If these people don't cry out, the stones will rebuke you because they will declare that all God that uh, had promised in the past is actually coming to, to, into being. Might be a little bit of a strange understanding uh, for us, but uh, uh, nonetheless, I think we can appreciate exactly what Jesus is saying. These stones will speak in condemnation if you don't speak out. And when we think of it, after all, the very Son of God is here, about to go to Calvary. The Messiah himself, surely somebody should proclaim him that he is Lord. The stones cry out. They do indeed, uh, in so many ways. Uh, it's there in, uh, in the fossil record. Although people don't like to admit it, but it very often testifies very clearly that uh, things have not evolved because they're just the same as they have always been. This tree is uh, the uh, Wollemia uh, pine. It's not actually a pine tree. It was found in Australia about probably 15, 20 years ago at the most. And it was found in the Blue Mountains. It, thought, it was thought that it was extinct. They had seen it in fossil records, but uh, they had thought it long since perished. Well, would you believe it? When they compared the fossil record with uh, uh, this, uh, this pine, they found that it hadn't changed at all. It was exactly the same. And they said this tree was millions of years old. The reason why scientists so often want to focus on millions of years, because they say we'll need slow changes for actually things to evolve. We never see it in our lifetime, so therefore it must be over millions of years that these things happen. But here, when they discovered this tree, they found it exactly as the fossil record has. The stones do indeed speak and cry out that God is creator. Actually, when we were uh, away recently, we had uh, somebody who does quite a lot of diving and uh, showed some tremendous pictures of uh, some of the sea creatures that she had filmed. And it was quite interesting, but she spoke of evolution. But at one point she said, uh, uh, the fossils show that this particular creature hasn't changed at all over the millions of years. And I thought, yeah, this is another one. How many times did they have to say that before the truth begins to dawn on them? It's very clearly... Uh, in the fossil record, in the stones that cry out to us, the God is creator, the world has not evolved. And I think it's interesting, I feel that God in some way, of course, uh, how these fossils came about was basically through the flood, because uh, something has to be overwhelmed quickly uh, and covered in mud, otherwise it would just go through the normal decaying process. Uh, but it's because of uh, that huge flood that we have the fossil record. And here it is that... Uh, God is creator, I believe. The stones do cry out 
in many ways. In other ways, uh, it's quite interesting. Uh, here's a word of prophecy in uh, Ezekiel 26 and verse 14. I've just given the one verse. But it's uh, Ezekiel prophesying the destruction of Tyre. And uh, Tyre at that uh, point was actually here uh, on the mainland where it says... I uh, uh, don't know if I can cut... Yes. Uh, there, the, it was over here, the old city... And uh, in actual fact, Nebuchadnezzar, and I'll give you the full record in a moment, uh, of one of our scientists who's uh, explained what happened. Nebuchadnezzar particularly wanted to take uh, Tyre, but he was interested in what was on the island, uh, because the island was uh, associated with uh, uh, special dyeing trade, nothing to do with death, but everything to do with clothing. And he wanted to know some of the secrets, amongst other things. And so, uh, as uh, Nebuchadnezzar came, uh, they retreated to the island. They were able to fortify it pretty well, and he couldn't even take it by sea. And so he built this causeway uh, slowly out to the island. It's a third of a mile long. And this is exactly what uh, Ezekiel prophesied. Ezekiel wrote about uh, uh, 593, um, the northern, uh, uh, the southern kingdom uh, uh, by 578 had been, um, uh, had been conquered. Obviously, Ezekiel was prophesying during that time. Uh, so that's when he wrote it, uh, right there uh, between 593 and uh, 587. And yet it was in, uh, if I can find the date there somewhere, uh, uh, 332, Alexander the Great. Uh, and this is a, a, a map showing what it was like, because he had built this causeway out, and uh, as you see there, they uh, uh, had destroyed the old city of Tyre, the rubble had been dumped into the sea, so he built a causeway out, and then uh, gradually the sand had washed up over the, uh, the rubble, and it built uh, basically a peninsula, but from that causeway, the sand built up. And Ezekiel talked about the city being destroyed and dumped into the sea and it would become a a place of fishermen to spread their nets. I'm not quite sure whether it was when I was uh, still a teenager or when I uh, first went into the ministry. Uh, There were what were known as fact and faith films. And they were very good and they were based on fact. But they were all pointing and encouraging faith in in the word of God and in uh, in the Bible, but in God himself. And uh, at that time, they had actually, when it was still very much like this, they had dug down into the sand where actually the fishermen were spreading their nets, and they found uh, rubble there from, uh, from the old city. And uh, they saw that it, uh, just as Scripture had said, it had come to pass. There have been some recent uh, 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 discoveries uh, carried out as well uh, Daily Telegraph apparently reported one and it uh, showed very clearly uh, that uh, this is exactly what happened that there was all the rubble and uh, that uh, the city had arisen uh, or rather the sand had, uh, uh, um, had been washed up over it and this is what it's like uh, today uh, they are very much the same but being built up on uh, but uh, So here again, the stones cry out. This is something of what uh, Scripture uh, does uh, uh, prophesy. And so again, we see, as it were, the stones uh, verify the Word of God. Uh, I thought uh, perhaps we might just, uh, as it were, uh, take a a short interlude and uh, look at that as well and see that there is a matter of testimony in the rocks in so many ways. But coming back to this uh, word uh, that uh, we have in Luke uh, 19, uh, Jesus there entering the city. Uh, Those words, behold your king, it's coming very much from Zechariah, where Zechariah is prophesying that uh, one would come to them. And he says, behold your king is coming to you. He is just and endowed with salvation. He is just and endowed with salvation. And of course, it goes on to speak of him coming uh, humbly uh, on a donkey and not on a war horse. Because he came to bring salvation. Some Jews would have thought that was to deliver them from Rome and from the uh, army of occupation. Uh, but we know very clearly that Jesus came to bring salvation. 
And that salvation was not to deliver them from Rome, but to deliver them from the power of Satan and sin and from the penalty of sin. So that one day you and I could go to heaven. Because Jesus paid the penalty for our sin upon the cross. So he was not coming to deliver them from Rome. He was coming to deliver them from, from sin and the, the power of sin and the penalty of sin. And to set them free as a people. My friends, that's uh, good news for every one of us. None of us need to fear whether we can go to heaven or not. Because if Jesus has died for our sins and we put our faith in him, then we know because God has said that he will count that faith as righteousness. When we really trust Jesus as Savior Lord, believing that he died in our place, paid that penalty for sin, even knew separation from God when he cried out, My God, why have you forsaken me as he died upon that cross? That's really what sin does. It separates us from a holy God. He knew that. I don't want to put it too strongly, but in a sense he went through hell, because hell is separation from God. He went through that for you and me, so that you and I don't have to experience that. So that hereafter we can actually know for sure that we're going to be with him in paradise, as he said to, to that man on the cross. But again, just remember those uh, words that we began with in Luke. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. He is indeed king. He came to establish a kingdom, not an earthly kingdom, but a heavenly kingdom. The rule of God in our lives. We often talk about receiving Jesus as Lord and Savior. Savior because he died for our sins. He saved us from the penalty of sin and indeed the power of sin making us different people. But when we receive him, we actually end the rebellion against God, as it were. We come back in subjection to God. We make him the Lord of our lives or the King of our lives, whatever way you want to put it, that he might rule in us, that we might do his will. It's not doing his will that saves us as such, it's faith in Christ that saves us. But when we really do come to faith, it will change our lives. So that we will want to do what God has instructed in his word. But here with the crowd saying we honour, blessed, we bow the knee as it were to the coming king. The kingdom of our father David. And uh, this morning I trust as we remember these things that happened. We really want to honour Jesus as king. To recognize that he came for our salvation, for every one of us. Not just for the Jews, but for the whole world. And of course, it does remind us, as I said in our prayer, that uh, in a sense, as we see Jesus received by the crowds, it's a picture of what is going to happen down through the centuries. The men and women would turn to Jesus as Lord and King of their lives, recognizing him to be Savior. And uh, that in the end, Jesus is coming again. And he will be received, he will be welcomed by all those who acknowledged him as, as Savior and Lord. And you know in, uh, in the book of Revelation there, in Revelation 12, I think it is, it says the kingdom of this world has come, become the kingdom of our God and his Christ. I think it's probably 11, not 12. Uh, the kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our God and his Christ, or Messiah. I think sometimes we use that word Christ and we forget it basically means Messiah, the promised one, the anointed one, the one that was appointed by God to be the saviour of the world. And you know, some people think they can save uh, themselves by all sorts of religious deeds, uh, by going to church. Going to church doesn't save you, but faith in Christ does. And when we come to faith in Christ, we obviously want to know more about the Christian faith. That's why we come. Not to earn our salvation, we can't do it. Or by any other religious acts. And of course other religions think that uh, by, uh, well, the five pillars of Islam, they'll get to paradise. No, not at all. It's simply by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, because God sent Jesus to be the only means, as Scripture says, the only means of salvation. There is uh, no other name under heaven by which men can be saved. If only those folks who greeted Jesus really understood. I think some did. Some later certainly came to know him. 
But this morning, let's say again, behold your king. He has come to bring salvation. And it's up to you whether you receive him as Lord of your life, as king of the kingdom, as it were, the rule of God in your life, or whether you are just prepared to go your own way still. So, my friends, in many ways, the stones even do testify to God as creator, to the authenticity of the word of God, that as uh, it was prophesied, sometimes uh, two or three hundred years, sometimes seven hundred years, or even far more than that. Because right at the beginning, when man first fell in sin, God said that the seed of woman would bruise the serpent's head, that Satan would be defeated by the, uh, the seed of a woman, eventually, of course, speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ. So this morning, as we think of that triumphant entry, let me ask you again, have you received Jesus as Savior and Lord of your life? Have you indeed beheld your King? who came to bring salvation for you. May he triumphantly enter into your heart and life this morning, because he is Lord. Let's pray. Father, as we come before you, we thank you that we've been able to look at these events once more. We pray, Lord, that you will help us, uh, that we might indeed understand more fully all that you came to do. Uh, We thank you for those events in Jerusalem, and yet, Lord, there is a sense of Uh, A tinge of sadness as we know that uh, many would turn against him and would want to crucify him. But Lord, we thank you that that crucifixion was for our salvation. So this morning we pray that, Lord, you will truly bless and speak to each one of us in that precious name of Jesus. Amen.